morning church I tell you what I have a story for you I've been asked and begged and pleaded with some of my guy friends to go camping <laughs> y'all know the avid outdoorsman that I am how excited I was to do this and I finally agreed and so we went camping and I was promised oh pastor this is gonna be unlike anything you've done before it's not gonna be hot it's gonna be all we're gonna go to the mountains see the mountains there's no summer there I got there, let me tell you folks, it was everything I thought it would be. It was horrible. There were bugs, it was hot and humid and muggy and more bugs, like spiders and ticks and things I couldn't identify and snakes. It was awful. Did I mention it was hot? You mentioned how much I love heat? It was, I have three fans up here today just to save you the coldness that I always put you through. Three fans, okay? So we're gonna try this today. So, yes, you're welcome, you're welcome. Here I am, making it as best I can with a positive attitude through this camping excursion into the third ring of Hades, just waiting for the sun to fall, and it finally does. And I get inside, he, you know, he brought this massive tent. You know, he could be on one side and I could be the other because it's manly, you know, we don't, we don't cuddle or anything. If it gets cold, we, we have each other's side. And I'm, I'm just waiting for the moment where I can get away from that campfire because it was 8,000 degrees and I'm trying hard to roast this marshmallow and I'm just drenched. And I get inside and I'm laying on top of my sleeping bag. You know what's hot when you roll over and the bag sticks to you and it goes with you. And I'm just, can't, I cannot get close enough to my battery powered fan. And I'm, it's got it aimed right at my face. I'm like, okay, Lord, please just let me go to sleep and maybe we can put this day behind us. And then it happened. I heard the sound I had been fearing. Something is in these woods. Did you know things live in the woods? I was like, okay, it's a squirrel, just relax, it's a squirrel. Then I heard a twig break, I'm thinking, that is a grizzly squirrel, that is something huge. And I'm like, well, I look over to my camping partner here, who's here today and will remain nameless, I will not divulge who this was that put me through this. I look over, he's not scared, well, I'm not scared. So I roll over again. Then I hear it again. This time it's closer, but I hear what sounds like heavy footfalls. Boom, boom. Almost like a snort, like a, I'm like, Bigfoot is in our backyard. Sasquatch is here. What am I going to do? And I'm like looking. I'm thinking, okay, he's still not scared, so I'm just going to play this. And then, y'all, I mean, it sounded like it was maybe from here to the lobby away. And I think, okay, we, I got to look. I got to check this out. So I unzip my tent. I got my little pocket light, and I shine it out, and I'm sweeping across and not 50 feet from us are those two glowing eyes. You know what I'm talking about, that eye shine where your light reflects? And these eyes are far apart. This is not a squirrel. And I'm looking and I'm like, that, my friends, is a bear. Yeah, that was my reaction too. I zipped that up and I look and I said, we got a bear. No longer is he Mr. Cool. Now he's sitting up and I said, what do we do? What do we, what we gotta do? I mean, you know, I mean, we're ready for bed. And the truck's over there. We got, we got to run. We got to do something. And I, and I look over, and he's putting on his tennis shoes. And I'm like, dude, we don't got time for that. We got a grizzly bear right outside our door. And I said, we don't, it's not like you can outrun the bear. Looks me straight in the eyes. He says, I don't plan on outrunning the bear. I just want to outrun you. <laughs> you can deal with the bear. <clears throat> that is the last time I go camping with Hayden Woodard. <laughs> I will not do that again. Now... Why do I tell you? Uh, that's not a true story, by the way. Just so, okay, there's no lies from the pulpit. Why do I tell that? Because today we're looking at friendships. That is not a good example of a friend. If you've got a friend like that who throws you to the wolves, literally, you need to run from them. They are not good for you. I hate to be the one to break it to you. They do not have your best interest at heart. When I mention good friendships, classic friendships, friendships that bring you up, who do you think of? Who are some famous ones? In fact, let's, let's, let's have some... Uh, dialogue here back and forth. You know I love interaction here. I'm going to put up a few pictures, and as soon as you, if you recognize who these famous friends are, would you shout out their names, okay? Let's just do that. Here's the first one. Everyone should get this one. <laughs> Batman and Robin. Yes, okay. Everybody got that one? Good, good. All right. Let's go a little, uh, little bit older, not too old, but let's just see for the young ones here what we got here. Mario and Luigi. Okay, all the Nintendo people knew that one. Yeah, my age and a little younger, right? All right, let's go real old school. Help me out with this. Who's this? 
Lone Ranger Tom. All right, raise your hand if you knew that. Watch this. Raise your hand if you did not know who that was. Uh huh. <laughs> Feeling old yet? All right, now let's go super new school. Those who just raised your hands that knew it, you probably don't know this next one because I didn't. Who's this right here? Oh, there it is. Give Caveman a gold star. Steven Alex, Minecraft. Apparently, this is a big deal. I don't know who this is, but let's keep it going. This is let's, more universal. Who's, who's classic friends are these? Kirk and Spock. Yes, gives you a warm fuzzy. Missy's loving this. This is, this is some of our favorites. Okay, all right. Now let's go super new school. Still in the theaters today. Who are these classic friends? Groot and Rocket. Who knew that? All right, who didn't know that? That's okay. That's all right. Okay. Here's another movie. Still in the theaters right now. What famous friends are these? Lightning McQueen and Mater. Good. You guys knew that. Okay. All right. One more classic friendship. Let's just see if you guys recognize this. Who's this right here? Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Thelma and Louise. I hear you. Okay. All right. Enough from the peanut gallery. The Bible talks about good friendships and how important it is that you have godly friends that bring you up that surround you, that link arms with you, that have your back. And that's what we're exploring today. You know all the famous scriptures. You know the ones like, as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. And that's awesome. We're like, yeah, I want to be that friend that sharpens. Or there's this friend that sticks closer than a brother. Closer than family? Yeah, we know those. But what we may not know is a slightly lesser known passage. And it's found in Ecclesiastes. Go ahead and turn there or pull up your favorite Bible app to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And while you pull that up, I'm going to welcome our online campus today and our streaming because we have a gob of them. Almost half our church is out of town, at the beach, or in the hospital. And I want to give a shout out here. We, you may not know this, but some people are suffering for Jesus in Hawaii. That's uh, Elliot and Leanne, the Bartons, okay? They're suffering, okay? So we're going to wave to them in just a minute. But we also have, for the first time ever, international... We have our very own Christopher Green, who is watching right now in Italy. Wave to Christopher. Hey, buddy. Woo! Yep, yep. But we have some hospital people. You wouldn't believe this. Joe Kisselberg was struck by a lightning bolt at work. He's okay. He's home. And I've been following up and, and reading his tweet. Joe, God bless you. You are a blessed man, and we are so glad that everything's good. We're waving to you, too. I know you're watching from home. We love you. And our, our very own Ryan Wisham has been in the hospital. He's still there. He's fighting pneumonia, but he's getting better, and he's going to be released today. I think, is Jennifer in here? Where's, okay. <laughs> Y'all, let me say it again. Ryan is in the hospital, and Jennifer chose to be here. <laughs> that is awesome. I don't know whether to applaud that or whether I should offer marriage counseling <laughs> after this, because that's, that's tenacity. Good for you. It's good to have you guys. Ryan, we love you, buddy. I hope you're feeling 100%, and we're thinking about you. And of course, my mom. She's always streaming. So hi, mom. Now, as our online campus continues to grow, we're going to see how important friendships really are. I want to give us a, a background because context is everything. When you look at a passage of scripture, it's important to know who it was written to, why it was written, what it says then, and what it means to you today. This was written by Solomon, the wisest, not only the wisest, but the wealthiest man to have ever lived, ever. So when the wisest man writes something, we might want to pay attention, especially when it's the inspired word of God. And what he says here, as we look at Solomon's life, the, the arc of his life can almost be charted. You can see his spiritual growth and his intellectual growth and his poetic growth, and it is astounding. He kicks it off in his early years as king with the Song of Solomon, which is full of life and vitality and all kinds of things. And if you haven't read it, you need to be at least 21 years old to read it, but go read it later and you can send me a thank you note because it is powerful and it is passionate. And you see him kind of going into the, the, the early ages of his reign and he's finding his way and there's some budding wisdom happening there. But then he hits into Proverbs and y'all, it is the peak of a mature king. He's finding all kinds of incredible things. He's so curious. His scientific inquisitiveness is on full display. Even his poetry and his writing is at its peak here. This is a king at the height of his power. And then we get to Ecclesiastes today, where he is clearly on the downside, where he's questioning things, and he's kind of struggling, and he's, man, vanity, vanity, all this, what, what is this all about? And it's almost like he's in his golden years, and you can kind of see him trying to wrap his arms around everything he's experienced. Everything he's lived, everything he's learned, he's trying to summarize it. And he does a pretty good job. And he comes up to this really powerful passage about godly friendships. 
And that's where we pick it up today. Look with me starting here in verse 9 through 12 of Ecclesiastes 4. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not easily broken. I love this. This is so powerful here. Don't miss it. By the way, for the teenagers and those who don't take this middle part out of context, if two get to lie down together, they will keep warm. This is not a justification for snuggling. This is, we're going to assume this is a married couple at this point, okay? So don't go home mom and dad and say, it's okay to cuddle. Pastor said it was. It's biblical. This isn't about that. This is, I think of these campers like we talked about in the tent. Where these men, you ever watch these survival shows? And these men, it's like, oh, well, I just brought a shirt and a little tank top thing, and it's going to get down to eight degrees. We're not going to snuggle or nothing. And, like, the camera's on them, and, like, by the end of the night, they're, like, spooning. They're, like, you know, right next to each other, and they're, they're cuddling. Okay? This is the point of us being able to keep. This goes so far beyond just strength in numbers or warming yourself by the fire or trying to stay alive. God is telling us we were created to experience community. We were not. Not one of us was meant to be an island living by himself or herself, trying to do life alone. It is so important. That's why we have the church. That's why we have small groups. That's so we can plug in and we can stand with each other and, and know that according to Scripture, choosing godly friends is so important. He puts so much emphasis. If you have good friends in your life, they are a blessing. But if you have bad friends in your circle, according to Scripture, they can feel like a curse. And the choice is ours. Knowing who we hang with is likely who we become. Who we hang out with is likely who we start to resemble. And I'm going to show you some powerful illustrations here about how to exercise godly wisdom in our relationships. Because the Bible gives us plenty. We've got Jonathan and David and Ruth and Naomi and their family ties there. And pa Paul and Timothy and Moses and Aaron, Elijah and Elisha. And even Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. All these great people. But I want to look at what God's word says. And I'm going to liken it back to the old tabernacle. There was a pastor named Jeff Bozinski, and I love what he shared with his congregation. He said, there's three levels of separation in the tabernacle, and you can think of your friendships in the same three levels. The old tabernacle had the outer court, then it had the inner court, a little bit closer, then it had the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, the most holy place. And he said, those people in your outer court, those are your casual friends. Those are your acquaintances, people that you know kind of from afar. You might know their name, but you kind of wave to them like, hey, I know you, you're in the back, okay. And you don't really interact with them much. And we won't spend much time on that because there's thousands of those in our life. Then he moves to the next one, which is the inner court. These are people who you've allowed to come a little bit closer. These are the people who are your closer friends. You know their names. You probably go out to eat lunch with them. You probably know certain details about their lives. They've been loyal. They're good friends. They've been there for you. And, and most of our friends will fall into this category. But there's one more. There's the holy of holies, that inner sanctum that is reserved for a precious few friends. These are the ones who will be with you through thick and thin. When all your other friends have walked out, these are the ones who are still there. They are sticking with you. They're not fickle. They don't just waltz in and out when things are good and leave when things get tough. If you call them at 3 a.m. and you have a flat tire, they will be there without question to change your tire. You know what I'm talking about? You can count these on less than one hand. These are your true friends. And they have probably earned the right to be called your best friend. And these are precious. And they can build you up or they can tear you apart. We're going to examine this last group the closest, okay? Now, hear me. I want to issue a warning. This is not about separating your friends into little cliques. This is not about taking what that guy said to his once in his congregation to these little cliques. This is not about, oh, you are a you're an outer circle friend, or you're a, you're a, you, you can come into the inner court, but no further, you smell bad, or this is one of my, oh, you're a holy holies, well, you just come right on in, okay? This isn't about us saying, you could be outside my circle of trust, you're here, but everybody else can come in, okay? So know that. This is about getting us to think about different levels of friendship, and how do we adjust these? So let's dive deeper into Solomon's writings. Look with me at Proverbs 12, verse 26. It says, the righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. There is an admonition for us right there from Solomon. Don't miss this. You who are righteous or want to be should choose your friends wisely. Be 
choosy about this. When it comes to your friends, we cannot afford to make unwise decisions. One of my favorite movies of all time, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where they're going, they're looking for the Holy Grail. You know what I'm talking about? And the bad guy gets there, and he finds this cave, and there's all these cups, and he's got to pick which one. And he thinks, if I drink this, I will have eternal life. But if he makes the wrong choice, he drinks damnation to himself. And he starts to wither, and he gets all, he looks like a mummy and stuff, because and, he picks wrong. And then there's this Knight Templar in there who's been there for 800 years waiting to protect this moment. And he looks at it, it's almost a funny moment, and he says, uh, he chose poorly because he died. That's a beautiful scene. Don't be that guy. Don't choose poorly. Hear me, especially young people, teenagers. We got a gob of them here. Don't fall into the trap of thinking your friends do not matter because God's word is so clearly, which brings us to secret number one. When choosing your close friends, it's okay to have high standards. When choosing your close friends, be choosy. There is admonition here for you to do that. Be picky, be choosy. Why? Because who you surround yourself with affects you. Who you let into your inner sanctum will have a huge impact on you, so make it count. In other words, who we hang out with is often who we become. We're going to see the scriptures here that talk about this. Now, think about this. How much can you really control in your life? Not much. You can't control your DNA. You can't control the weather. You can't control your taxes. You can't control choosing your friends. This is the one area in your life that you almost have total control over. Think about that. You have all the say in this. Godly friendships are incredible, and they are vital. Those that you let into the Holy of Holies are likely to be your friends for life. And some of you know some of those friends. People like Pat Lancaster and Jim. Friends that will get your back, that are there. They have been there for life. You know what I'm saying? You don't question them. You don't question their loyalty, and you don't question their friendship. And they will grow sweeter and sweeter as the years go. But there was a second part to that verse. Did you catch it? It said, the wicked leads them astray. Oh, here's where it starts hitting a little bit close to home. Those who walk in opposition to God's word have the power to influence you away from God's word. They can pull you astray. So it's okay to insert a little distance between people who will do you harm, especially new believers. Hear me. Young people, especially like teenagers and stuff, and you're feeling your oats and you're about to move out and find, hear me on this, who you allow into your sphere of influence matters greatly. It matters so much. Scripture tells us that bad company corrupts, and, and, and it is one of those things that, that tears your character apart. I remember being a, a youth. I was 16, 17 years old, and I'll never forget. It's like 30-something years ago, and I'm sitting on the front row, and the youth pastor comes in. He goes, I'm going to show you just how much your friends have an effect on you how easy it is to be brought down. And he picked out the biggest guy in the youth group, Big Bad Brad. And he said, Big Bad Brad, come on up here. He's this huge guy. Somehow he's 17 years old, but he's been shaving since he was four. You know what I'm talking about with the big beard? And he's just like lumberjack. Big Bad Brad comes up and he goes, now let me get Scrawny Steve. Come on up. So Scrawny Steve comes up. He's this little squirrely guy. Probably can't even bench press a wet paper towel. And he comes up and his job is given the mission to take this guy out, but to do it in a gentle way. Brad stands in a chair, big bad Brad. His goal is to pull scrawny Steve up into the chair when he says go. Steve's job is to resist that and if possible, get Brad to come out of the chair when the youth pastor says go. So we're all sitting there and we know where this is going and we say, all right, let's go. So he's like, all right, you cheer, here we go. Three, two, one, let the pulling begin. Within a second, scrawny Steve has yanked big bad Brad out of that chair. Why? That's secret number two. It is so much easier to be brought down than it is to bring someone up. It is so much easier. You ever tried this? You have all the leverage in the world surrounded by your friends down here. But that one up there didn't have that. And it was so much easier. And it shocked us. And I remember it years later because that's what 1 Corinthians 15, says. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You ever heard the phrase, you are known by the company you keep? That's it. If you want to live right, you've got to keep the right company. Just as righteous and godly friends can be a blessing, the wrong people can be a curse. Don't fellowship only with those who walk in darkness. It's not healthy for us. Don't fellowship only with those who constantly sin and have no intention of repenting. The admonition says, guys, bad company will corrupt your good character. If you don't believe this, this happened to me. Believe it or not, years ago, I worked in construction. Yes, construction. How would you like me to be the one who built your house? <laughs> Run! <laughs> She's going to blow. 
I remember being on this construction site, and there were guys surrounding me, and I'll tell you what, they knew where I stood, and I could tell where they stood, and never the two shall meet. They mocked me, they laughed at me, they made fun of me. That was okay, but what was really hard was the way they talked, the words they used, the stuff, that, the jokes they would tell. Oh, my goodness. And I remember being a young guy saying, guys, can you knock it off? I mean, just help me. I'm trying not to be this, you know, that guy, the, 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 the stick in the mud. But this stuff was downright offensive. So every now and then I would speak up and I would remind them they would laugh at me and we'd have that, you know, and that's okay, that happens. But what's not okay is what happened when I went home. After working on that job site for about 90 days, it's, it's all I lasted. After that 90th day, I remember coming home, working on a project, and I missed the nail. And I hit my thumb. Y'all, that hurts. Here's what scared me. The words that ran through my mind to say frightened me. They matched what I had been hearing. You feel me? The stuff that had been going into my mind, even though I wasn't saying it, but the stuff I was exposed to, the stuff that was pouring into me came out at the last minute when I had no clue that that was lurking. Why? Because Scripture says bad company will corrupt good character. I had slowly been looking like my friends. Here's the part that bothers me. I didn't even know it. They had been having more of an impact on me than I thought. Well, Scripture tells me that. George Barna made a huge splash 20 years ago, wrote a great book called The Frog in the Kettle. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is a fantastic illustration that will stick with you. Apparently, frogs are cold-blooded. What does that mean? That means that their body temperature will match its surroundings. It will rise or fall depending on what it's around. Humans, we're not like that. We're warm-blooded, meaning our temperature, by and large, stays exactly the same. We shiver when we're cold at the potter's hand, and we sweat when we're hot, when you're standing up here. That's just what we do. That's how our body reacts. If you were to take a frog and drop him into a pot of boiling water, he would immediately sense the difference and jump out. But if you put the frog in room temperature water and slowly turn up the heat, the frog stays there and keeps adjusting its body temperature to match the rising heat around it. By the time the frog realizes the heat is too much for him to take, it's too late. He's already gone. That is such a powerful illustration. Just like us, we can get lulled into this false sense that everything's fine. But the frog says otherwise. Your surroundings matter. Who you surround yourself with matters. So what do we do if we claim to have friends who's a believer? They say, oh, I'm a believer. I, I believe in that. I believe just like you. But they're just not living it. Well, they, you know, they, they have this uh, total other lifestyle. Pastor, can I hang out with them? I get this from the youth all the time. Here's what we're supposed to do, okay? You recognize these people, and you've seen them. Maybe they at one time were walking with the Lord. They were so tight. I mean, they were on fire. They were winning people to Jesus. And then you go and you see that they've just, it's almost like they're flaunting their rebelliousness. You seen this, like pictures on Facebook? They're like, hey, yeah, pass another one. And I'm hammered. Look, at I'm at the beach again, 50 weeks in a row. And, you know, church, I love God. Woo. They got their shirt, I heart Jesus on, you know, and it's just like, it's just the weirdest thing. And they flaunt their rebelliousness. And you're trying to make sense of it, and you got these new Christians trying to make sense, and we're confusing the lost world where we say we preach one thing and we don't practice it, and then we wonder why they're confused and don't want to be like us, and we wonder why they don't want to have what we have. Well, there's a word for it. It's called hypocrisy. It's called hypocrisy, and we send this confusing message. God's response to that is this. Always, always, always leave the door open to friends like that, but you don't surround yourself with only friends like that. Does that make sense? Check in with them. Pray for them. Don't stop loving them. Always be ready for, to, to, to reestablish that. Periodically, you go back to them. But while you do it, Scripture says you surround yourself with people who are committed to pulling you up, people who are committed to godliness, to pursuing a path of purity. That's what he's saying. Bad company corrupts good character. Are you surrounding yourself with that or this? This is, this is our cue to depart from those who refuse to repent. It is okay to put some space between you and people who bring you down, which brings us to secret number three. Secret number three, if someone is consistently bringing you away from Christ, it is okay to temporarily let them go. <gasps> Pastor, are you serious? How's that? Young people listen to this especially. If someone is consistently being offensive to your walk, and they are dragging you away from and you find yourself acting more like the lost world than you do following the Savior, you need to check that friendship because that is a toxic friendship. 
Listen to what the scriptures say here. It is damaging your testimony and your witness for Christ. There is nothing more important in your life than your walk with Christ. Nothing. You living like the Savior, there is nothing more important than that. So especially teenagers and new believers, if someone is pulling you away, if someone is making you feel like you're drinking a toxic poison or they're abusive, that is not a godly thing. It is okay to temporarily put some space between you. Now notice what I didn't say. It's not okay to abandon them. It is not okay to call curses down on their head and say, I shun you, I don't want to be with you, I give up on you. God didn't do that to us, and we're not to do that to them. You pray for them. You let them know that you love them. You let them know where you stand, and your hand is always outstretched. Invite them to things that bring them up. Invite them to church events. Invite them to things where you are going to outnumber those who don't believe like you. And they can rally around that and see the salt and the light that we're called to be. And they go, there is something different about you. What am I doing? Because many times they don't mean this, but they have slipped down a slippery slope and they don't even know it until it's too late. What kind of friend are you? When people look at you, are you the one that's always bringing them up? Awesome. Or are you the one that's kind of pulling them down, helping them down that, that slippery slope? Again, the scripture's not saying give up on them. Always be there. Always pray for them. Invite them to hear the, the gospel. Invite them to opportunities to come. Be open to sharing your faith when they're receptive. The warning is this. Don't let them affect you more than you are affecting them. That's the key. Jesus was never brought down to their level. He always maintained his purity. He wasn't afraid to periodically go where the sinners were and to help them out, but he never lived like them. Does that make sense? Are you with me on this? When I was a youth pastor, I was so I was amused and I was hurt at the same time when I'd have teenagers in my own youth group come up and they would be starry-eyed. They'd have a new love in their life. Oh, Pastor Matt, I can't wait for you to meet so-and-so. And they'd bring him in and it would be this legendary guy that the whole city knew. And everybody knew they were bad news for this person, except that one person who's in love. Pastor Matt, this person is so, oh, I can't wait. Are you talking about so-and-so? Yeah. Didn't he just get arrested last week? With the, you know, she said, you don't understand. My job is to win him to the Lord. I'm going to date him into the kingdom. Oh, poor soul. <laughs> Nowhere in Scripture do you see a commission of dating as a missionary. It's not in there. It is, missionary dating is not. In fact, if you're honest, just the opposite is mentioned. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 6.14. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What does righteousness and wickedness have in common? What are you doing? What fellowship does light have with darkness? We're not to be unequally yoked with a person who lives in total opposition to everything you believe, who lives in opposition to God's word. I promise you that sweet girl who means well is going to come under so much ridiculous pressure from that guy that she is starry-eyed in love with who just got arrested for drugs and beating up his previous girlfriend and stuff. I'm going to change him. Well, let him be changed, be his friend, love him into the kingdom, but you're not supposed to be a missionary dater. That is the admonition here. We're not supposed to be. Proverbs 13, 20 puts it this way. He who walks with wise people will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Destroyed. I love how the New Living puts it. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble, right? That's what I wanted to say to these youth. I was only two or three years older than them. I know what I'm talking about to these little young whippersnappers. I'm like, y'all, I know you're in love, but hear me, young people, who you associate with in these formative years is so important, which leads us to the last secret. Choose friends who will have your back, who will bring you up and not bring you down. When Saul was on the warpath, he was literally trying to track down David and kill him. Jonathan stuck out his neck for his friend. He went to bat for his friend. He had David's back. Read this with me. 1 Samuel 19. It says, Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, for he has not sinned against you. And because his works, remember this, he has been very good towards you. You know what the paraphrase is of this? Dad... I know you, you're angry at this guy and you're jealous and something's wrong between you two, but he has been a good guy. Need I point out how awesome he has been to you? You want to talk about going out on a limb, getting this guy's back? That son had everything to lose by confronting his father and saying, why are you angry with this guy? It would have been so easy, be honest, for Jonathan to say nothing. David was watching this friendship, and when he stuck his neck out, 
You think that meant something to David? You think he knew right away, this guy has my back. This is a friend who sticks closer than a family member. This is who we long to be. When the chips are down, when everything's coming against you, and you need someone to stand with you when life is rough, it is not enough to just remain neutral. Hear me. That is not a friend you need. You need someone who stands back to back, sore drawn, loving and defending your honor. Think about this. He, he, it wasn't just enough to, to stand beside him. Notice, notice what he did here in the scriptures. It said he spoke well of his friend, even pointing out and reminding Saul, hey, Dad, uh, David has been very good to you. Do, do I need to remind you of this? This is incredible. Choose friends like that who have your back, friends that defend you, that will speak well of you. Friends that not only refuse to gossip about you, but will actually go to the gossipers and point out the sin and say, that's not right. Anybody want a friend like that? Absolutely. Well, here's the rub. We're called to be friends like that. How you doing? How you stacking up? That's our standard. How you stack up with that? Are you trustworthy? Have you earned the right to be in that holy of holies, in that circle of friends that gets your back? Almost everybody in here, I think we could call each other probably at 3 in the morning, and you'd be there. You're awesome people. But some of these people who are on our periphery, man, we need to love them. We need to keep that open hand. But if we surround ourselves only with people who are bringing us away from Christ, man, we need to check that. We need people who will bring us up. The bottom line is this. We can do things God's way, which brings blessing and peace. Or we can do things man's way, which brings stress and drama. Oh, who needs more drama and pain, sorrow? We need relationships that enhance our walk with God. So take a moment and think right now about your circle of friends. Is there someone who floats through your mind right now who exemplifies all these good characteristics? Are there people who float through your mind right now who may be a toxic friendship? who might be bad news for you, who might be pulling you away from Christ. And you know, you're smart. You know if they're bringing out the best in you or if they're bringing you down. Okay, here's what I want you to do. This is your challenge. This is your homework assignment this week. I want you to picture that one person who just raced through your mind, that one who brings you up, that one who stands with you, who exemplifies Jonathan and David. And I want you to find them and thank them because they are a jewel. They are precious. They will be your friends for life, okay? Now, they may even be in this room today, and if so, you got an easy homework assignment. You can knock that out before you even go to lunch. For someone else, it may be making a phone call. It may be reaching out on Facebook. It might be saying, hey, you know what? Because somebody did this to me. Things I had forgotten about 20 years ago. I said, Pastor Matt, you won't believe this. Because of your stance when you stood up and you were, I'm in the ministry today. I reached out to a friend named Steve Bishop and said, thank you. And another friend named Eddie Briscoe. And I said, you stood with me when no one else would. Back when I had long hair and skinny jeans and I looked like a girl and it was like terrible days and pimples and stuff, he stood with me. You think that mattered to me? Absolutely. And I thanked him. And it blew his mind that I remembered 30 years ago. You have that chance to edify somebody today. That is your mission. That is your homework assignment. In just a minute, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And we're going to have a moment of, of prayer. And the altar is going to be open. I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come up now. You may want to pray for that friend. You may have somebody in your family. You may have somebody that's on your heart right now. Would you pray for them? God is laying it on your heart, and they are pulling, and, and, and you got that tension. This is your chance. Maybe you've been looking at the church for a long time, and you're ready to unite with that. You can come tell me, and we can make that official. Or maybe you saw the baptism last week, and you've been on the fence, and you want to be baptized. Or maybe this whole thing is foreign to you and you don't, you don't even know about Jesus. You just want to know about him. I would love to talk with you. And if we don't have time here, I will stay after church as long as you want. It'll be an honor. This is your time. Just be obedient, okay? Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. This is your time. Just be obedient to whatever the Lord is leading you today. The altar is open.